Ready? I pledge allegiance to the flag, to the flag of the United, United, United States, States of America and to the, to the republic for which it stands, one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Roll call, please. Chair West. Yes. Director Lopez. Here. Director Mulhart. Here. Director Perello. Here. Director Borchard. Here. Okay, for the record, we should note that the alternate uh, Raul Avila is here as well. Uh, agenda review, any changes to the agenda recommended? None, Chair. All right, we'll move on to public comments. This is an opportunity for anybody wishing to address the board on matters not otherwise on today's, count, uh, today's agenda to come forward and be heard. Seeing no movement and hearing no voices, we'll go on to board member comments. Any comments from the board before we proceed with the regular agenda? One comment is water still flowing. <laughs> still going Good news. Down the river, still going into the ground. Amen. Keep it up. All right, we'll move on then to the consent agenda. There's only one item, unless someone has a question or a comment. The chair will entertain a motion to approve the consent agenda. So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? None. Moving on to item number two, um, consideration of the GSP for the Arroyo Santa Rosa Basin. is, okay. <laughs> hello, um, this item is uh, for your board to consider adoption of a resolution that will adopt the groundwater sustainability plan for the Royal Santa Rosa Valley Basin, as well as authorizing the executive officer to uh, sign a memorandum of agreement with the Royal Santa Rosa Valley Groundwater Sustainability Agency. All right, looks like we're ready to go here with slides. So uh, this is just a little bit of a, a review. Um, you, your board had a presentation last month from both uh, Fox Canyon staff and, and uh, Brian Bondi, a consultant preparing the GSP, and as well as uh, an overview on uh, in January. But the um, Fox Canyon boundary marked in red here. Let's see if I can control my cursor. Uh, no, don't see it. Um, includes um, the a western portion of the Santa Rosa Valley Basin, which is shown in green there next to the Pleasant Valley to the west and the Las Posas Valley Basin to the north, um, separated by the Bailey Fault. Um, there are 14 active agricultural wells in the Fox Canyon portion that are registered to nine COM codes. There's no domestic or M&I pumping within the Fox Canyon portion of the basin. And the annual average extractions are about 1,200 acre feet a year. The basin was originally uh, prioritized by DWR as medium priority, but then reprioritized as very low in 2019. The Arroyo Santa Rosa Valley um, Groundwater Sustainability Agency formed in 2016 to manage the portion of the basin outside of Fox Canyon's jurisdiction. Um, and it it's a, a JPA between the Camarosa Water District and the county of Ventura. And uh, the GSA, um, decided to uh, um, prepare a GSP even though it was no longer required under the new um, prioritization for the better the benefit of the basin, basin to better manage the basin. Um, and, uh, and where it says ASRBB opted, and I'm realizing I should say GSA, um, was awarded a DWR grant to prepare the GSP. And the GSP draft was prepared. Um, it covers the entire base, including the Fox Canyon area. It was prepared in coordination with, uh, with our agency, with Fox Canyon. And as I mentioned, uh, we've given you updates in the past, but most recently, January and April of this year. Um, and the, 
There was a public draft, 40 day, five day public comment period from February through mid-March, um, which was uh, advertised on both our websites, uh, um, Rosanna Rosa Valley, TSA, and Fox Canyon. So the GSP divides the basin into these two management areas, the FCGMA management area and AR um, GSA or ASRV uh, GSA um, management area. Um, they'll be managed under that single GSP, but Fox Canyon will manage the Fox Canyon portion. The Rosanna Rosa Valley GSA will manage their portion. The GSP have, um, developed a water budget for the entire basin and um, and evaluate or estimated the sustainable yield about 5,300 acre feet per year. And the modeling projections project that the basin will remain relatively in balance uh, without overdraft over the 50 year planning horizon that's required by the Sustainable Groundwater Management Act. Um, the sustainability goal in the plan, the overriding goal, is to maintain sustainable conditions in the basin, thereby supporting beneficial uses and users of groundwater without causing undesirable results under future conditions. It further states the GSAs, which are ASR GSA and uh, FCGMA, also desire to collaborate with other agencies and stakeholders within the basin to improve groundwater quality of the basin. So that's just a brief overview. You had the full overview last month. Any uh, questions about the GSP before I move on to uh, the resolution that's before you? Just one question. Appreciate the presentation. On this last slide, it says <clears throat> undesirable results under future conditions. Do we have a list of what we expect the future conditions to be? Or are we assuming, and I know that's a rough word, but whatever happens? No, it's certainly not whatever happens. There's very um, prescribed requirements in the Groundwater Sustainability Plan emergency regulations promulgated by DWR for all the future conditions that have to be evaluated and looked at in the Groundwater Sustainability Plan. That was all done, and then all, that all went into a... Um, uh, numerical groundwater model to project that out. So um, it was well thought out and researched and uh, done within the parameters uh, and guidance that DWR prescribes. Thank you, that was my question. Thank you. Sure. So um, my comment is, is I, I like, I, I liked the presentation last month. Obviously I like this and I commend the process. This is a simple, relatively simple within the world of groundwater, a relatively simple process that works and it's logical. Um, and more importantly, we have scientific data to prove it. I'm pleased that we uh, have um, data that was done by modeling. We recognize the fault. We recognize that it, it now has a baseline we recognize that based on that model, it should be able to operate for a number of years without difficulty, but we have a reference point and we have established that reference point that if we have suspicions, we can go back and remodel it and see if that model is still valid. I think that's the way it ought to be done. This whole process ought to be done. And obviously in the more complex basins, it's a long, arduous process that we do um, on an annual basis or some token of that. But in this case, it's logical, it's reasonable, it's simple, and so I support your motion or your recommendation. Very good. Why don't you go ahead and review the resolution and then we'll convene the public hearing to consider its adoption. So the resolution before you, which is in your, uh, attached to your packet, um, would adopt the uh, GSB and make some other findings, uh, including those findings are that the jurisdictions in the basin, uh, namely City of Thousand Oaks and County of Ventura, were notified 
at least 90 days ahead of the, today's public hearing on the proposed adoption of the GSP. That's required by Sigma. Notice was published on both of the GSA's websites. Your board is holding a public hearing, so the, the findings will be that you held that. And um, your board will make the finding that adoption of the GSP is statutorily and categorically exempt from CEQA based on the uh, cited uh, water code and CEQA guidelines sections. Um, we also have the MOU to discuss. Mr. Want me to hold off on that? Yeah, we'll do this in two bites. Okay, okay. very good. If there are no other questions from the board at this time, we'll convene the public hearing um, with respect to uh, resolution 2023-02 and invite any members of the public who are interested to address the board with respect to uh, that resolution. Again, seeing no movement and hearing no voices, we'll come back to the board. And again, if there are no questions from the board, is there a motion to adopt resolution 2023-02? Uh, so moved. And a second? Second. Need a roll call for the resolution? Chair West? Yes. Director Lopez? Yes. Director Mulhart? Yes. Director Prello? Yes. Director Borchard? Yes. Yes, thank you, everyone. Okay, now let's move to the MOU. Okay, very good. Um, so there's a memor mem memorandum of understanding before your board today, just uh, Basically, it's a statement of intent between the agencies. This is very similar to the MOU that was uh, executed under the authority of your board for the Oxnard and Pleasant Valley Basin GSPs, where the, there's a portion along the eastern edge of each of those basins, also east of the Bailey Fault, um, that is under the jurisdiction of two Camrosa GSAs, and so uh, it's quite similar to the, that MOU. And it basically says that Fox Canyon will retain jurisdiction over groundwater management, clean regulation of uh, groundwater extraction in the SCGMA management area, clean receiving those reports and associated extraction fees. The ASR GSA will retain jurisdiction in the ASR GSA management um, similarly, including uh, regulation of groundwater extractions, um, and uh, as of now, they have not implemented any fees, but would if they um, do. Should the ASR GSA require groundwater extraction reporting from pumpers in the ASR GSA management area, both of the agencies will work together to coordinate reporting and data management. And should the ASR GSA impose extraction fees, um, both uh, ASR GSA and GMA will coordinate on what, if any, portion of the current extraction fees level on pumpers in the basin in the Fox Canyon area or any new fees to be levied on pumpers in the Fox Canyon area should support administration in ASR um, of the ASR GSA. Water supply or other resource management projects may span the jurisdictional boundaries between the two uh, agencies as well as Camarosa and other uh, overlapping agencies. And basically it states that funding considerations for any such projects uh, will, if necessary, be deliberated uh, by the various agencies and decided upon or agreed upon on a case-by-case -case basis. ASR GSA and FCGMA will be responsible for the administration and monitoring program costs within the respective management areas. Uh, the agencies will share groundwater data needed for the sustainable groundwater management of the basin and implementation of the GSP. And finally, it says the foregoing is subject to change upon mutual agreement and coordinated update to this MOU. And so that's pretty much all that MOU says. And um, I'm happy to ask, answer any questions on the uh, MOU. I have one comment. I want to just actually thank, thank staff and Camrosa staff for a clear, concise, and mercifully short 
<laughs> MOU. Um, that's, uh, with that, any questions from the board? Yes. So a quick question. The, uh, the, obviously, the Fox Canyon portion is in Fox Canyon. Are they subject to the current extraction fees that are levied against GMA, Fox Canyon GMA extractors? Those pumpers are paying those current fees. Okay. Of course. Uh, so, um, it, it seems very, I mean, pretty clear the the, the defined areas and, and and management. But um, if there is any uh, legal issues, who, where does where is liability? Where does that fall? Um, could could you repeat? I couldn't hear the question. Could you repeat that? If if there's uh, any legal issues in this, who has who's who takes on the liability? Well, I'll uh, defer to uh, county council on that. Well, this MOU would not affect whatever legal issues would come up. This is simply an agreement between the two agencies to okay. coordinate their management of the basin under this GSP. Okay. Right. Thank you. If there are no other questions from the board at this time, let me invite any questions or comments from the public. All right, hearing none, let me come back to the board. Any further questions? And if not, is there a motion to authorize the uh, executive officer to sign the MOU on behalf of the agency? I'll move approval. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? None. Moving on then to the next item on the agenda with respect to Comcoats. Thank you, everyone. Chair West, board members, Arnie Anselm, staff to the GMA. This is a continuing item uh, held over from last month on the management of comm codes and the ability for the agency uh, to manage the basin sustainably. Where did we leave off last month? We're not going to repeat that hour and a half long presentation, are we? Are we going to no, pick up from where we left off? No, I'm going to go. Very fast. Okay, we do have a, an alternate board member here, so please stop me if you have any questions. No. Uh, but it is the same. <laughs> it is the same slide deck, so I'll, I'll go quick. But, um, but it's, this is not my presentation. Okay. So while that's going on, I'll, I'll do my quick overview. So Comcode again is just the basic reporting unit that the agency sees as a customer. It combines all the allocations of several wells or a single well. And uh, if there are extractions uh, above the allocation, the surcharges are combined as well. Uh, there are several issues that we have talked about over Comcodes. I'm gonna go over those issues, but also go over the board direction we've seen, received to date on uh, from many of the meetings we've had and what we have been able to implement. And then some are going to require ordinance changes to implement. And even the ones that we have um, affected through executive officer order, we would, uh, I think would be better to have an ordinance as well. So we're looking for your feedback today. There's no action item decision today. It's, it's board direction on, on the ordinances that we would bring back to your board. I'm gonna keep going. So com codes combine the allocations of wells. It's not the only tool available. There's also the assignments of allocation where two well owners can come to agreement and transfer an allocation as well. So I just, that's a reminder that there, this isn't the only tool to combine allocations. <laughs> In our previous workshops, um, we've uh, discussed owner accountability, multiple owner com codes, and that multiple owner com codes is really the, thank you, the crux of the situation. That's the one that complicates uh, the combining of allocations, also want the one that really complicates the variances or variance approvals. And variance approvals have been on hold until we, uh, until your board um, is comfortable with how com codes are created and managed within the basin. So let me jump ahead here. Uh, so with the previous meetings, um, um, we've had several meetings in the past. We've gotten board directions uh, direction that com codes should not be changing during the water year and that a well owner's permission should be required to combine wells with uh, the wells allocation into a com code. Those two we've affected already. 
Um, but again, an ordinance would be, uh, I think, would provide clarity on, on how that's implemented. Uh, other direction, the earliest any new restrictions combining common code should be October 1st, 2023, and, and I think we got that direction last September. We're still working on this. Uh, allocation carryover should be apportioned by percent allocation the well brings into the com code, and that one would require an ordinance change uh, uh, to amend the operator authorization forms to clarify well owners' continued responsibility, and that one we talked about quite a bit last time, and it, we landed that one. Uh, um, but I think we, we will work with council to make sure we get the right legal language on the authorization forms, and that uh, we've heard uh, a request that all well owners provide updated information on their contact information, who is the owner of the well, how to, um, and get those details correct in our database. So, so before you leave that chart, since you've got the two of them up there, the issue of well owner's permission and an amended operator authorization form to clarify, those are two hot topics that we have beat around for quite a while. Um, I, it may be implicit in what you're saying and you've abbreviated, abbreviated it, but I, having thought about it since the last meeting, I believe that that well owner's permission needs to be written, needs to be notarized, because we cannot keep dealing with this argument, I did not know about it, right? And we need to tie that owner's written permission with the title that's on that facility or property so that we don't go down that rabbit hole of saying, hey, wait a minute, there were multiple owners and we didn't collectively give our authority. So I, I, I hate to go through this process, but when you listen to the debate that we've had and the responses we've had, I didn't know, I thought they took care of it, and people have been left with some pretty hefty fines that they're now dealing with, and so we need to close these loops. So I would encourage us to be aggressive about the documentation side of the equation. And that includes these little bullet lines. And if it's already in your strategy, then I'm just emphasizing it. If it's not in your strategy, I think it's part of the feedback I want to give you. While we're on that same subject, I noticed that there happened to be, but by coincidence, in the executive officer's report, a sample of a, an authorization form that was filled out for a property unrelated to this discussion. But I noticed in looking at it, not only is it missing the, the language that you've suggested adding it, but this particular authorization form apparently came back altered, where the property owner uh, crossed out language that uh, explains the owner's continuing responsibility and then limited, attempted to limit in another area, the responsibility for um, costs and fees and whatever else I can't read has been crossed out. Um, I, I don't know that you need to make a change to the form, but if there's going to be a revised ordinance or resolution, it should be made clear. No altered authorization, authorization form will be accepted and if a, an operator receives an authorization form like that and over pumps the allocation in one area in reliance on that sort of an authorization form, form they're still gonna be subject to surcharges because we will not accept uh, altered authorization forms under any circumstances. If, if there is such a need, come back with a formal variance request, but no unilaterally altered authorization forms will be considered much less accepted. I think, I think that language should be clear. Mm -hmm. Yes. I appreciate the comments that have been made, but I have one question specifically on, I think it's the fourth bullet point. Um, when it's talking about wells, and just in my experience, the wells go with the land the pumps and the apparatus to extract the water out of the well can be a tenant or a leasee, whoever else. But are there any cases where the wells are not tied to the land? My legally, understanding, legally? There, are, there are a few where the well is owned separately from the land. Um, 
I see that as as another problem to be addressed. Well, I think I think uh, my comment would be I think we're there are wells that service multiple parcels. In our case, my dad farmed three separate parcels with one well. He owned one, his sister owned one, and his brother owned one. Now, in turn, this is long before the GMA. We're talking back in the 50s, 60s, 70s, 80s, long before we got into this business. And if you look at well distribution and parcel distribution and family irrigating practices on different ranches, um, this gets to be very complex. And so I'm not sure we can meet your requirement. In fact, I think one of the things that is being proposed um, is that the allocation, some groups are proposing allocation go to the land and not to the wellhead. I don't know if, I, but this is dealing with the well. What we need to do is we need to know exactly what parcels are served by this well. And the parcel owners of those parcels that are served by this well need to go through the process of documenting, signing, and notarizing with the restrictions that the chair has talked about and others that staff believe. What we have to do is we have to get our hands around the reporting process to avoid the kinds of delays and comments we've gotten from constituents that had led us, have led us down this road. I didn't know I was supposed to pay. The operator doesn't know we were supposed to pay. We've had both sides of the equation played against us. We cannot let that happen. So anything we do in this com code process we have to close this door, in, and Director Perello raises a great issue, but I'm not his, sure his solution is the correct solution, but we're going to have to address it. Okay. Thank you. That's all we got. Okay. Uh, quickly overview the, the concerns that we're, we're uh, discussing today. We just talked about the multiple owner accountability, uh, I mean, owner accountability, multiple owner com codes. Uh, all of this is impacting the variance approval process. There's the issue of transfer between pumping, uh, between management areas, the allocation carryover, we've, uh, I think we've landed that one. Uh, the frequent changes to com codes, I think we've landed that one as well. Uh, all of this affects the water market, the size of the, the wells, but the water market will be, uh, if it comes back, will be a separate ordin ordinance, so different decisions there. Um, and then the transition to a new code, com code policy, if we adopt new ordinances, how are we going to transition all the existing com codes to that? So the owner accountability, that's what we've just been discussing. discussing the, um, the recommendation is to um, amend the, the forms. I think we've got some good direction on that. Uh, so the multiple owner com codes, we had a good discussion on this last time. Uh, I think we I think we concluded public comment, uh, but I don't think we got um, full direction on how to uh, address this issue. So the issue is that when there are multiple owners, multiple well owners combined into a com code, that's where uh, the shared responsibility of the well owners um, with the other wells needs the clarity. And this is the issue uh, we, we've just been discussing and. Uh, You've heard these challenges on appeals, um, compliance appeals, I, um, but this one also affects all the other issues, the variance approval, the transfer of pumping between management areas. Our recommendation, we have two recommendations, they're, they're mutually exclusive. The most restrictive would be to limit com codes to wells of the same owner. That one, from a agency standpoint, from an administrative standpoint, would clean things up um, for us and uh, allow our management uh, of the basins to be much more effective. It's probably very problematic for the pumpers. So the other option is to continue to allow multiple owners to combine wells to com codes and amend the ordinance code, uh, ordinance code to clearly define the individual responsibilities. Um, the, we talked about the couple of, of ways fines that could be based if it's volumetric uh, to the whole com code then that's apportioned by well allocation. Uh, well specific penalties would still remain the responsibility of that well owner. Um, but also to inform all owners within the COM code, when the COM code is formed, of the comp composition and the use of the wells in the COM code. So right now, they, uh, uh, 
a well owner who's designated an operator does not know all the other wells that are included with them in that COM code. So back to the authorization form, um, it should include all the wells and the well allocations that are being brought into the COM code, the identity, identity of the other well owners, and an understanding of the parcels irrigated. And I understand that may change throughout the year, but it would give the well owners entering into this COM code a better understanding of how their water will be used. Changes in well ownership uh, if through a, a lease or a sale of land should require new signatures and resubmittal from, from all parties. And the operator should provide an owners of an annual report of the total extracted from each well, basically copy the report that the, the GMA gets. So the owners are kept, um, are aware of, of the total pumping of that comp code and how their allocation fits in and if there are surcharge liabilities. So before you leave that page, um, I understand what you're trying to do with changes in the well ownership that require new signature. I mean, that's totally obvious. That's another problem that we've been running into, right? There's a lot of movement that goes on as growers change fields that they're going to farm and families change their title to the property because of whatever, deaths or whatever. I, I think the concept of changes in well ownership should require a new signature is absolutely correct. I think the devil is in the tracking of that process, and we have been bitten by that issue as well. My suggestion is, as feedback, is that we need to come up with more detail on how we're going to make sure that that happens. Do we certify, do growers at the beginning of a crop year <clears throat> or whenever the reporting period begins or ends or whenever they do their statements or however it's done, do we then have them at that time reaffirm that the documentation that they sent in on X date is still valid as of that date. I don't know. So that if we go down the road and we find out that there has been a change in ownership, we have at least two benchmarks of a date. The problem is that individual could be long gone and how do we recover that? We'll get into that same fight that we have right now. That wasn't my problem. That was somebody skipped out on, on, on the deal. So that paragraph right there, I think, is part of the problem where I think there's a growers that are upset that the system is not robust enough to prevent the gaming or cheating. People don't like that word, but that's what actually happens. The gaming of the system, and I think we need to put a lot of thought into how we make that particular sentence, which I think, or a line, which I think is totally correct, actually functional. And I don't have an answer as I sit here, but I'm raising the question. If I can add to that, um, because a concern is that unless something is filed, you don't know if there's a change, right? So I don't know if perhaps there is a need to do some type of recertification so that it's not just a one-time uh, filing and then anything can happen in between. Uh, until someone, uh, until there is a change in in the in the com code uh, in that particular area, or someone gets added, or whatever it is, but having that recertification in some capacity so that there there is a, a little bit more of a check and balance rather than just waiting for something to fall through. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Arnie, would you go back to the previous slide? <clears throat> I think we discussed this last time. I don't remember. But with respect to the apportionment of volumetric fees and surcharges, I don't like the idea at all. I don't think they should be apportioned. A joining a com code is a partnership. Now, typically, in a partnership, if one par partner incurs liabilities for the partnership, every partner is jointly and severally responsible for the entirety of that obligation. This should be no different. Instead of leaving it up to the GMA to figure out who the members are and what their proportional surcharges should be, nonsense. Every member of the comp code is jointly and severally responsible for all the fees and surcharges. 
If you don't want that liability, don't join the comm code or make sure you know what's going on within it. But I don't think making work for staff or shifting the liability from the management of the comm code to the agency makes sense. Why don't you keep going then? Okay, Go ahead. that's a good point. Uh, for the, Ms. Lovitz, there were fines, tremendously huge fines over the last year and a half, and then they would be waived because there were discussions nobody told me, and um, so tightening it up so that nobody can slip through the crack mistakenly or on purpose, I think is the, the whole thing, and, and there's good, good exchange here. Thank you. We up to... In, excuse me. Go ahead. There's no way that we should admit, make the administration much more important, more penal, uh, potentially expensive for this agency than need be. And I think uh, the chair hit it on the head. So at the last meeting, we had public comment on each item. I think we had the public. We'll comment do it at the end. It. We'll get through this and we'll do public comment on all of this at the end. Okay. So um, I'm going to move on to variance approval unless you want. Yes. Okay. So variance approvals have been put on hold because of your, your board's concern that the findings to support a variance approval for one well on the parcels it irrigates, uh, that, that, that those findings may not represent how that allocation may be used when it joins into a comp code. And that comp code, uh, it may be in a completely different comp code a few years from now. So the, the understanding of the reasons for that variance may not accurately affect how the water is used uh, out on the, the Oxnard Plain. Um, so again, uh, COM code combines all the allocations. If the variance is granted to one well, that allocation is now available to any well within a COM code that that same well is in, which could be different owners, different parcels, and it may increase, uh, have result in increasing transfers between management areas. So the recommendations are, again, we had the two recommendations for multiple owners. If your board directs COM codes to be restricted to wells under the same owner, it's gonna eliminate the concern of a variance approval going to one well owner uh, and it being pumped from any well. It can only be pumped, again, that additional allocation could only be pumped from another well owned by that same owner. Uh, and that uh, restriction would also greatly reduce the number of COM codes, the size of COM codes, so the, the transfers between management areas would also be greatly reduced. If your board chooses to allow multiple, multiple owner COM codes, um, you just need to have the understanding that when variance approval is approved, that that uh, additional allocation uh, may be pumped in any other well within the same COM code. And only restrictions to how COM codes are formed will limit how that additional allocation can be pumped. I don't sense much of an appetite on the board for imposing the kind of hardships that limiting COM codes to commonly owned property might might um, impose. That's not really the purpose of this. But I am sensitive to the concerns about the impact of shifting water transfers and, and variance requests. Uh, perhaps, in, in you consider resolutions or ordinance changes, uh, it might be appropriate uh, to make whatever changes are necessary essentially to deny any variance request for wells within a COM code unless the applicant can um, demonstrate that during the period of time being used to calculate the variance, the water was actually used on the parcels serviced by that well and not transferred elsewhere. If that can't be demonstrated, the variance is denied. If it can't be demonstrated, the variance might be appropriate. But that would be a way to accommodate both interests, both the diverse ownership of com codes, as well as the vagaries of granting variances for water that may be pumped, may have been pumped elsewhere. Just give it some thought, that's a. I have a follow-up question to that. So what happens if uh, the variance is approved and then, uh, that well is removed from the comp code. Then that allocation stays with the owner of the well. Okay, 
Yes. Okay. Thank you. So, so another, uh, maybe another way of looking at, maybe another way to looking at the com code is, is really a transfer methodology. I mean, that's fundamentally what it does. It's, it's, it's designed to allow a common operator, in effect, to be able to be flexible to his growing pattern, crop patterns, uh, whatever it happens to be. Is that safe? Yeah, yeah it is. Uh, but a simpler way, and the way we look at it, is it's, it creates a mini water market. And that, I, it, we're saying the same thing. Yes. What I, what I think is part of the problem, and it's dumped on the GMA staff to try to figure this out, to because it has a responsibility to make sure everybody's playing within the boundaries. We're, we're effectively, that's our, that's our job, to manage the boundaries and make sure that grower A and grower B and C are treated, and no one is getting ahead of the game, because there's obviously big money. Do we have a robust transfer reporting form that defines exactly where the water from that particular well, what parcel it went to, and then we can validate it against the meter reading that we get down the road. Have we? Do we have a sophisticated tracking system? Or are we, and do we need that? So, I mean, I'll make it even that big. It, seem, it seems to me that if you're gonna have a com code system that is not finite in its size, you know, right? As it, ga as it gains width and depth, it is potentially more susceptible to mischief in the water transfer process. And do we track that? Should we track that? I don't know. And what do we do if we should? I think that's a valid discussion. Yeah, I think you saw Kim Loeb stand up here. I should have introduced him at the beginning because I know he's going to help me out. I'm not that familiar with the operations and reporting side, so I'll, I'll allow Kim to answer that. So, Director Malhart, um, two pieces to that. We do have um, a specific transfer process for what we are called in the ordinance um, temporary assignments within a water year, where water is transferred from well, one well to another well or allocation within that water year. Um, there's also permanent transfers, but that's a whole other thing. Um, that is a fairly straightforward process. We do ask where the water is going to be um, used. But in terms of tracking, ultimately, we're tracking at the well. We know how much was pumped at uh, one well or, or at each well. We do ask for additional reporting, which is submitted to us in terms of what were all the um, parcels irrigated within the COM code, but we do not have uh, the ability, and I'm not sure necessarily um, the operators in all cases have the ability to tell you exactly what water went from what, what, what parcel. They can combine and tell you what all combined went. I might just uh, uh, add to that the fact that it, it's all self-reported. In the past, we've noticed problems when there are multiple crops, knowing what water was used where because they don't report those intervals. We get a, we get a sum up. Um, and so when Kim's talking about this assignment of allocation, that doesn't happen inside a comp code. That's when two individual well owners want to talk. Inside a comp code, it just gets mixed. They report total usage and sort of where it was used. Go ahead, Kim. You going to correct um, me on that? That's correct. Well, we do have extractions at each well, but it does just go into the um, total allocation within that comp code because the comp code is the the sum of all the allocation. It, of the in other words, if uh, there was a full extraction at this well, but it wasn't all used on those properties that it usually served, it was used somewhere else, they would not be required to send in this assignment. My so the is, com code is just a big water, a hidden water market run by whoever it is that uh, is reporting. So in, the, in some cases, it's a corporation that has assembled a bunch of farms. So my follow-up question is, should we be tracking it? 
So from Jeff's perspective, my answer to it would be yes, because we, uh, I mean, just from the science alone, we've never really, we, that data would be important, it could be important later in, remember, the irrigation efficiency and trying to figure out what crops use what amount of water. We always knew that we needed to refine those numbers, and we got started. We got a good start at that, but uh, we never finished it. And it, for that reason alone, but um, that's but just strictly a science data issue, not necessarily a public policy issue. Yeah. Might I just follow on and say, yes, we should ultimately be doing that, but we don't have the infrastructure to do that right now. We've talked about the need for a new data management system that is in process. We expect that process to pick up. That'll be a GIS-based system. We'll be able to track parcels and that kind of thing. Ultimately, there'll be a lot more coming to your board on that. We've started definitions. We have new staff on board, an assistant groundwater manager. It's going to help lead that effort, and so your folks will be hearing a lot more about that. I, I, I'm not trying to create an, a nightmare, because, uh, uh, because having filled out these forms over the years that I was part of creating. It's a pain, <laughs> and and I, and I, I have a com code. It's a con code, con code, con code of one, one well, one parcel. Um, it's pretty straightforward. So I'm trying to think in my mind a model that has a lot of moving parts, and I look at the Security Exchange Commission. I look at the bank. I have multiple bank accounts. And the bank doesn't tell me where to put the money and not to put the money, but the bank keeps track of where that money goes inside my accounts and flags me that you, got, you don't have enough there and whatever the case may be. And I am wondering, you're asking for feedback. I'm wondering if one of the tasks that you should have is taking a look at what is it going to take to build and pay for a system that tracks where this water goes, because essentially it is an exchange process, and we need to get our hands, uh, hands around it. And I know that we can't do it instantaneously for the reasons you talked about, but if we're going to go down that road that I'm suggesting, we need to send the signal out now that... We're going to start down that road, and maybe there ought to be a process, a manual process, that we can then turn into a formal process. So a uh, suggestion for your board to consider. Um, all of what we do relies on the reporting that comes to us. So while we might build it on this end, if they don't report it right, um, it's, it's useless. And we have to go back and correct like we've done. So uh, perhaps something that can be considered by your board or suggestion would be that before you um, can enter into a COM code, you have to degree, uh, agree that you're going to report all intervals, all, all water locations, where all the water went. You know, certainly that was always possible with the single owner um, ship model. Um, and that would, um, that would uh, accomplish those things you want. We would know where the water went at what intervals and, um, and we could keep that database and it could be a GIS based database your board could use. Let me, let me ask a broader question if it's possible. Um, <clears throat> it seems that because allocation transfers, temporary, temporary allocation transfers weren't available, under emergency ordinance E, that created the circumstance that allowed, or that maybe necessitated com codes to grow and grow and grow. Now that the current allocation ordinances allow a temporary transfer of allocation, are com codes even necessary? It's a question I'd be curious, I don't even need an immediate answer, I'd be curious in the grand scheme to hear hear what staff thinks and what the public public thinks because, you know, are not temporary allocation transfers a way to accomplish exactly what com codes do otherwise, and it would be a less complicated system to track when those temporary allocation transfer requests come in? It's a great question, and I'd like to take the first response at that. Of course, it could work that way, and we prefer it, but I think the, real, the underlying motivation here isn't so much the transfer of the allocations as the avoidance of the water market. Um, and that may, you know, because people fear the water market is going to set prices and there, there are going to be restrictions and so on. So, so when they group up this much 
much water. I don't really think it's because they're afraid of the forms or that individuals are. It's more um, so that they can control the, the cost of the water, I think. So that's my immediate observation, but we'll definitely take a deeper dive on that. In, in, in the, uh, going back to the item in front of us in the, in the recommendation, the ultimate recommendation uh, that you're asking a record, provide feedback and direction to staff to prepare an ordinance modification or a resolution. And I think we're having a discussion on things that may need to be looked at, mm -hmm. and that's why I'm bringing them up now. I don't want to bring them up. When, if we agree that we're come, let's bring it up for vote, I don't want to be bringing this stuff up later. That's why I'm bringing it up now. I don't have the answers, but I think this system that we have I believe the system we have has a series of problems. And I appreciate what the chair said, that it was a solution to a problem because of emergency ordinance E. And maybe, that maybe ought to look at, is it time to come up with a different system instead of trying to patch up a system that is hugely complex in my opinion and open for all kinds of mischief, in my opinion. If we're not there already, let's move on to the allocation carryover and the other items on your, right. on your <clears throat> list. Uh, next is transfer of pumping between management areas. <clears throat> uh, your board's been given a few presentations on the management areas. Uh, it's some parts of the basin are impacted, pumping there will uh, increase saline intrusion, other parts of the basin are more healthy. Uh, Com codes allow the transfers from wells in the healthy areas to the, the more impacted areas. Uh, the Las Posas Valley Allocation Ordinance requires a variance to combine wells in the different management areas and the OPV Allocation Ordinance reserves the ability to do that upon a finding by your board that it's necessary to implement the, the groundwater sustainability plan. Uh, and the pilot water market was set up to restrict transfers between management areas if it was going to increase pumping in the uh, pumping trough depression or the saline intrusion area. Um, the impact of seawater intrusion due to the transfer of pumping um, was presented to your board in December of last year uh, and a shift from the Forebay or West Oxnard Plain management areas to the saline intrusion area, the pumping depression management area was quantified. We could see that that was happening, uh, but the upper and lower aquifers uh, impacts were not examined and may have just a significant, if not more, um, amount of impact. So uh, we were able to show that there's an impact, but we were not certain that it's the significant driver of saline intrusion area. And certainly with the drought, there were a lot less deliveries from the Santa Clara River, so there's an increased pumping in those areas, in the pumping trough depression as well. So the recommendation here is if, if the implementation of other changes to multi-owner comp codes um, that your board is discussing, that may have the impact of reducing uh, the size of comp codes and the transfers between management areas, and that we can continue monitoring um, uh, the impacts to the management areas and return to your board with recommendations if we are seeing uh, significant impacts from the transfer of pumping between management areas. Thank you. Allocation carryover, this one we, we discussed very, very, fairly thoroughly. Uh, the, uh, the ordinances allow carryover of unused allocation. That unused allocation currently is proportioned equally among all the wells uh, to the next water year. Um, being evenly divided, even if one com code is bringing significantly more allocation to the com code. Uh, past, past discussions, there was a general agreement to apportion allocation by the, I'm sorry, proportion carryover by the allocation the well brings to the com code. Uh, that would require an ordinance uh, amendment, and so our recommendation is to have that uh, amendment. I guess, is this a a solution in search of a problem, or is there a real problem? Who cares? I mean, if the folks that get together and combine in a com code decide that they want to evenly apportion any carryover, does that, I guess, whom, whom does that affect? Why do we care if at the end of the day it all nets out to be the same amount of water? 
or are we just creating another administrator? We would. Only, I I don't know that we would care, except that somebody separates from the com code and wants to take their carryover that, with them. Okay. That it, so that's that would be a reason, among. Yep, understood. Mm -hmm. But it, is it is it something that we have to solve? Is it something we can require? They would come to us when they separated, and we would be in the middle of that argument. Okay. So. Yeah, right. I think I know where Kim's going on this. With the with the, the uh, allocation carryover, and over time, it could result to a transfer of allocation to a well that might be in one of the management areas, and now that well has a much more significant allocation okay. to pump. Go ahead. Uh, yeah, board. I just wanted to add that um, the current. Division is what came out of the discussions at the executive committee and, and ultimately board. And then in follow-up discussions, people said, well, we don't know why it went that way. Um, we, as QMA, we really don't have, uh, we're fine either way. It's a simple change for us to implement. Um, it seems to be, there seems to be consensus that it's a more logical way of doing it. So uh, staff is fine with it. So if your board, uh, we would put the footnote in that if you separate, you need, uh, the carryovers between you and your your com code holder, right? You separate the. You don't get any. You don't get any. You separate the carryover goes away. There you go. So uh, I'll take that as board direction. <laughs> Just an, it's a it's an, a thought. That's a, a random thought. I don't. Uh, <laughs> It, I wish a, my kids were as observant, but that's <laughs> a, <laughs> it's a valid question, and I think you ought to weigh in on it with what your recommendation is. It's another valid question, <clears throat> Partic particularly if you're transferring water to an area that we don't want pumped, and then it reverts back, and they get that increased in pumping in an area we dearly don't want pumped. So again, there. Conceptually, these problems are pretty simple. When you get down into the detail, they become complex, and this is one of them. Mm -hmm. Moving on. Frequent changes to COM codes. This is another one that we have discussed pretty thoroughly in the past. Uh, we, we have experienced many changes uh, to COM codes, wells coming in and out during the water year, creating uh, administrative burden for staff. Uh, your board gave direction. Uh, that they should not be changing during the water year, and we've implemented that. Um, but we, an ordinance amendment would make this much more clear uh, to require uh, a notice of the change of wells be submitted by June 30th prior to the water year starting October 1st. And then if there is a change of uh, owner or operator mid-year due to leases changing or, or um, land being sold, that the registered COM code operator at the start of the water year is still responsible for reporting extractions at the end of the year. So we're not chasing uh, different well owners or different operators due to changes that happen during the year. Okay, the water market uh, is affected by the COM code policy and we saw it pretty clearly over the first three years of the water market pilot um, in terms of participation and eligibility. Uh, and s simply because of the consolidation of more and more wells into larger and larger com codes, essentially making their own private water market that's um, beyond the eyes of the, the GMA, uh, the data was pretty clear. And I don't have the numbers in the slide here, but it was we had participation of I want to say like 15, 20 com codes, uh, and a large amount of wells, and and the number of wells pretty much stayed the same over the time. But over, by the third year, we only had uh, five or six com codes being able to be partners, and those are kind of made up numbers, so don't hold me to that. But it definitely went down, and the reduction in number of trading partners in the water market really impacts the, the viability of the water market, because there are just less buyers and sellers, but there's as many wells trading water amongst themselves within a com code. So um, as the discussion has been today, those large com codes are creating their own water market. And those are without the restrictions that are on the water market, that you can't increase uh, pumping in the management areas. Um, the water market is it's a separate ordinance uh, um, that if we continue it, we can have uh, much thorough discussion on, on how to handle the water market side of the equation. But 
changes uh, to com code policy here will affect the um, viability of the water market. Except maybe we should simplify the process some. And, and I, I understand the water market's a standalone separate item, but as you consider changes, we're recommending changes to the com codes, it seems to me that we need to, to um, as the slides is create a, a level playing field, um, uh, harmonize the entry requirements for both qualifying wells in a com code and the water market. It, certainly well owners can choose where they wanna do business, but the restrictions, if there are any, the limitations should be the same. Uh, there shouldn't be entry barriers for one that the other is exempt from. Um, and, um, and the same thing would be true, not just for, for you know, entry restrictions, but also in terms of pumping restrictions. If management, if, if pumping is gonna be restricted within the management area for the water market, it should equally be affected um, for com codes uh, or and and along those same lines as, we, as we've discussed, you know maybe it's time simply to take the training wheels off, open up the area, and let's see what happens for a couple of years. Um, but I, I think one of the ways again, as you consider what might be done with com codes, consider that the same thing may need to be done with the water markets and what effect those changes would have. Okay, so the, to, tra to transition to a new comp code policy, if we do have new ordinances with new requirements and restrictions, um, one, again, your board wait, uh, recommended waiting till the start of the next water year. Um, but we would like to, nice to have everybody, all the comp codes, have a clean start that they are in compliance with uh, whatever new ordinances uh, your board approves. Uh, so we'd like to verify the existing comp codes uh, meet those requirements. Uh, and so the recommendation is an ordinance or resolution um, to require all owners and operators to submit by a date, uh, a one-time certification confirming their acknowledgement and compliance with any amended ordinances. And that could include um, having the new forms we discussed and the, and the new language in there from yeah. all owners. I think the timeline's too ambitious. I don't think you're gonna get it done by the start of the 2023 water year. Um, and I don't think we need to worry about that yet. There's a lot of things that need to be done and considered before even adopted and along these. So, so setting that you know a compliance date of June 30th, that's just impractical. Mm -hmm. And and given everything that needs to be done, I'm not so sure that it would be. It could be done and fairly implemented by October one of this year. My suggestion would be, as staff puts together resolutions. Uh, or proposed ordinance changes to allow the community a broader opportunity to discuss those, bring those back first through the executive committee for review and public comment and discussion so they can be marked up as necessary and then brought back to the board for further discussion among the board and the public so that it isn't sprung as a surprise on anybody. And I, because of that, I don't think October one's gonna work. <laughs> Understood. I, the only the only other comment I would have is, and I, I think somebody, I think maybe you, you brought it up, is that I'm not sure a one-time certification is the answer. Mm -hmm. I think we need to look at a, 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 a period where maybe an, it's an annual recertification. We need to build the form such that uh, I, I affirm that my previous report dated blah, 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 whatever, I don't know. But what we need to do is close the loop into this ongoing process where people come in and we now have to deal with loopholes or not loopholes, uh, weaknesses that we built into the system that we now have to fix. Mm -hmm. This is the, if we're gonna do this, and I think we need to do, a, valid, a validation of the com code process. And if we're gonna delay the timeline, then we need to have our ducks in order. And I think it needs to be an annual certification. And that gives us another reset point on an, on an annualized basis. Thank you. 
clarifying question. I got that part about harmonizing the entry requirements, but I, I, does that extend to harmonizing the, you know, the remain, uh, you know, being able to stay in requirements? In other words, the recertification would happen with the water market folks as well as the. Uh, yeah, it, any of these ideas. Arm code folks. Yeah, so. All right. I, I mean, and the truth of the matter is done efficiently since you're doing a new data basin management system or data management system. None of this stuff should be done manually. None of it should be done on pen and ink. It should all be done online. It should all be done based on past codes of operators and stakeholders who can all go in and, and do the certifications online, populate the database so you can tell at a glance at a screen. Nobody should be shuffling paper to do any of this. That's the ideal world. <laughs> Quick disclaimer on the Lost Valley. Lost Postes Valley Basin adjudication. So if the Superior Court issues a final judgment, uh, a final comprehensive adjudication, which adopts the proposed phase three settlement terms, um, that will all be on a separate process. And, and what we're discussing here will not apply. All right, we'll go back, put up the, oh. oops. That, never mind, go ahead, go ahead. You like that one? Okay. Yeah, that one's fine. Sorry for the small font. We discussed a lot today, but these are just real summary points of, of what all the other slides had for discussion. Before we proceed to take more questions and comments from the board, let me do this now. Let me ask members of the public that have sat through this these last couple of meetings to, to um, address the board with any questions, comments, thoughts you have on, on any of the recommendations or any of the uh, highlighted subjects. Come on, Jurgen. You know you want to come up. Just in there, you just don't want to be first. That's all. That's uh. <coughs> man. He threw that fish hook out with no bait on it, and you <laughs> jumped on it, Jurgen. What are you thinking? It's called, you it's need called, to you need to push sight back fishing. a little bit and say no, no, no. At the the bite. It's is called sight big. fishing. You can see the fish in the water. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I don't even have to introduce myself. <laughs> <laughs> so Jurgen Jurgen Gramko with Southland Sod Farms. Um, yeah, I don't see these things as as complex as they've been presented, but that may be because I don't deal with all the permutations. <laughs> <clears throat> but from the, the the standpoint of what qualifies, who should qualify for a com code? I mean. If you have commonly owned properties, then you ought to be able to combine them. If you have commonly owned properties and you're leasing your neighbor's property, that is to say you're contiguous, you ought to be able to put that into your comp code. Um, and, uh, you know, probably, probably cover it. Um, to the extent you have commonly owned properties that aren't contiguous, I still think you ought to be able to com code those, simply because you're responsible for both. You might as be able. You might as well manage your water among both. So, um, you know, I could put this on paper probably easier than you know try to explain it, but I don't. I don't think it's that hard. But others have. I think more permutations on this than than, than we do. Um, and as to the management areas, you know, I've come up here a few times and said that, and, and this kind of the, the management areas in the water market relate to one another, and they relate to one another in that <clears throat> if you're in a restricted management area, you can't buy water and bring it into that area, so that limits the water market. Really, more than ComCodes does. It's, and I think the way to look at management areas is not to try to restrict pumping in there because um, ultimately that creates an inequity. If you're going to restrict a management area and and and, and not restrict another, we what we need to focus on is bringing in supplemental water into that management area and let that management area be free to be in the market like other areas. For example, the seawater intrusion area, um, we could take water from the Oxnard AWPF line instead of pumping, and we do to some extent, but it's really, right now, it's a trade for 
uh, Oxnard moving the pumping elsewhere. So that's a benefit to the aquifer. But at some point, we're not going to have enough allocation to trade anymore. At that point, it's going to be a cash price. And right now, that looks pretty expensive. So that takes us to replenishment fees and sort of spreading that burden. Um, so I don't know how far down the road that is. Um, the unused allocations, um, I think we all agree that the unused allocations that come out of a com code um, should go back to the wells in that com code in proportion to the water that those wells contributed in. Um, just, just, makes, just makes common sense. I think that's all I had. Thanks. Thank Anyone else? Gene, you can say something else real quick, and you're going to come back up. <laughs> <laughs> no, Greg's going to do that oh, for Greg, me. That's, uh... Greg bought on that fish with no, <laughs> that line with no fish. <laughs> I, I was ready to go. He got the seat faster than I Yeah, did. I saw him knock it down. So, <laughs> uh, Greg Lewis, speaking on behalf of Duda Farm Fresh Foods and Duda Farm Fresh Foods only. Uh, we are a, a landowner, a grower, packer vegetable shipper. And before I um, address the presentation, I did want to just uh, address a couple comments that I recently heard. I heard that, first of all, Chair West, directors, thank you for the opportunity to speak. I apologize for not commencing with that. I heard a comment that emergency drought ordinance E did not permit allocation transfers. And I believe that to be true, but, but it's really a moot point because the IAI is what was embedded in emergency drought ordinance E. That was our allocation plan. It wasn't land-based. It wasn't wellhead-based. It was crop-based. That was a level playing field. Every operator, every grower had the same amount of water to use irrespective of the water source. So well allocation transfers, whether or not they were permitted or not in E, I'm not sure how that applies to um, com code conversation. And then there was another comment of the consolidations of wells into a larger com code was to avoid the water market and to control the cost. Well, that to me is it's very curious to hear and unfortunately very sad. That is the reason why the system is broken today is because of that disconnect between that comment and what really is happening in the ag agricultural sector. Because we were told to consolidate our wells into larger com codes by staff to avoid buying water from ourselves. That's why we consolidated and aggregated all of the wells into large com codes. Because without that, my company, we operate like 30 wells, probably qualify as the cartels that have been referred to. But we had five com codes. And I chose to have four over here, five over here, three over here, six over there, where they were geographically located. And I apologize because I've told this story before, but there are some new people here. At the end of a water year, I was contacted by Dr. Finup and informed that one of my comm codes had pumped 100 acre feet in excess of its allocation, and I had a week to buy water. I was also informed that one of my other comm codes had um, 180 acre feet that hadn't been pumped yet. So I said, great, let's just transfer 100 acre feet from Duda 1 to Duda 2. Oh, can't do that, Greg. Needs to go across the water market desk. Okay, so I will get past the administrative process that I had to endure, but I ended up buying water for myself at a fee. So in order to cure that, it was recommended to me to consolidate all of my wells into this large comp code. So it wasn't to avoid the water market or control the cost, it was just the advice I was given to do. And that's what many people did. 
not to avoid the water market, not to control the cost. Thank you for your presentation today, Arnie. Just a couple of comments. Um, I've been following the com code issue since the dates that were presented in the bottom right corner of one of the first slides. And I've attended the meetings and Arnie did reach out to me last year. We spent some time on the phone. So the stakeholder input uh, was there. So thank you for that. And I've been asking myself since then, do we have a procedural issue or, or do we have a substantive issue with, with the com codes? And unfortunately, I think we have a little of both. And from the substantive side, I think what we need to ask ourselves is, is the aggregation of multiple com codes, excuse me, multiple wells into a single large com code causing irreparable harm to the basin? Are we triggering the minimum thresholds of the seven deadly sins? Are we not complying with Sigma? That's our job, is the basin management, not business management, the basin management. And so substantively, if the aggregation of multiple wells in a single COM code could cause greater pumping to occur in scientifically proven and data-driven management areas, then the cure, as presented, is not to unravel all the COM codes, but don't let multiple wells exist in a single COM code if they come from different management areas. If you happen to be in a distinguished management area, you can't bring water in from a well that is outside of that area. And if that reduces the amount of water that that landowner op and landowner and operator is able or not able to pump, well then to Jurgen's point, that operator needs to be made whole. That operator needs to have surface water available to him or her. But to cure that substantive issue, don't allow water to cross those management lines. Procedurally, it appears that there is an administrative burden and complexity that accompanies the changing of hands of wells during the water year. One solution, and I think Arnie presented this, it's a great solution, identify a window, 30, 60 day window, with which we landowners and operators have to take wells out of one com code and put into another. Unraveling the consolidation of multiple wells in a single com code is not going to cure this burden and complexity because conveyances will continue to happen. Land will continue to be bought and sold and leased and subleased. And so by unraveling the ability to aggregate wells into one com code does not cure that. What cures it is, okay, we landowner operators have a window of time, that's it, this is when you get to do it. If you do it, or, and what has to happen, if the leasehold changes hands in a window outside of that 60 days, well then it's up, to, it's up to those two landowners, those two operators to figure out, hey, I'm responsible for the water up to this date, you're responsible for the water subsequent to that date. That's on us, we're big boys, we're business operators. Doesn't need to be your problem. Moving on to the water market. Um, I don't think there are many in the ag community who directly oppose the water market, but I think we need to understand that the water market is ancillary to allocations, whether they are land-based and they're wellhead-based. Dr. Finep has presented to us on a number of occasions the um, successes of the water market, the quantities of water being traded, the number of participants. Um, from staff report, it appears that the issue may be the smaller operator is, is not on the level playing field. Well, I'm not sure how unraveling these large com codes is going to cure that. Um, we are all capitalists here. If there happen to be more water on the water market because we anticipate being ramped down, you will just have larger operators spending more money in gobbling up that water. 
it, it will just continue, you know, if there's a limited supply, drive the price up, if it even makes it to the water market to begin with. And if that is the case, that, that, is, that is a may or a could, have we heard from a single smaller operator that has complained that today's conditions are having adverse impacts on his or her business. To my knowledge, I haven't read any letters filed to the GMA, I haven't seen them come to the podium or appear on Zoom, but conversely, what we have had is multiple small, medium, and large operators appear on Zoom, write letters, and talk at the podium that the system we have is, is just fine and, and working. Um, just want to express that I'd like to encourage more, more basin management. We operators are here to help versus business management on your end. And I think breaking down all of these larger comm codes into single comm codes is just going to create more work for your staff. And so let me ask you a question. We there was some discussion about property transfers that occur during the middle of the water year. Um, I don't know if you've had any experience with that or your company has, but um, any suggestions on uh, I, the, the solution of let the operators worry about it is fine if the operators are still here, but, but often enough it's occurred when property transfers, one of the transferees disappears, and, and by the end of the year when you're trying to hold the remaining person responsible for all of that water, the answer is, well, I didn't use it, it wasn't me, I didn't know. We want to avoid that. Any, any thoughts on how to deal with those transfer issues that occur in the middle of a water year? At the end of the day, the responsibility needs to wind up with the landowner. And he or she who has had his or her head buried in the clouds for the past decade as we have embarked on these water issues will continue to have his or her head in the clouds irrespective of whether larger comm codes are unraveled or not. And so it, the, the, the buck stops with the landowner. And so if that conveyance happens during the water year, well, there needs to be a recording with the GMA that there is a new property owner and that it's really up to that property owner and his or her tenant to have an agreement that, for example, Gary Arnold is my landlord, one of my landlords. I've got like 40 of them, it's terrible. But he and I just had this conversation. The responsibility is on my landlord to bear all the burden of all the GMA and all the United fees and all the other regu regulatory action that comes with property ownership. If he or she wants to pass that burden on, well then it is incumbent upon them to include that in their agreement with their tenant. That any penalties, fine, surcharges, or levies associated with the GMA or um, sent to me by any regulatory agency are your responsibility. That's, that's how it works. Did I answer your question? If it happens in season, Chair West, you know, the DMV has regulations that say when you move between state to state, you have 21 days to change your driver's license. I don't know. If there is a property transfer during the middle of the water here, you've got X amount of time to um, communicate this to the GMA and United. But it's going to happen, you know. Um, ultimately, I think the responsibility is borne by the landowner. Thank you. Any other questions? Okay. Good afternoon, Gary Arnold, uh, here appearing for myself and my LLC, Arnold Ranch LLC. I'd like to speak to exactly what Greg was uh, talking about uh, as, an, as a simple owner here. The problem that I expressed last time was, I don't have a problem, let me go back to something I said earlier, about joint and several liability. As long as I know that I'm in a general partnership and who my partners are. I very much appreciated, I think, Director Mulhart's comments. Sure. Having a pre-water uh, year 
certification signed by the owner and my tenant slash operator saying, okay, your well or your property is going to be consolidated with these other wells, these other properties, and now I know who I'm on the hook for, joint and several liability. I don't mind that as long as I know who I'm in partnership with. That's never been the case. And as I mentioned last time, it was before the penalties, before the allocations, pumping charges, a few thousand dollars. Now we're talking hundreds of thousands of dollars. So the dynamics of the penalty and surcharges versus the pumping charges become much more dramatic. And so I think it's much more important to have that certification done in advance of every water year. And I, and I, and I don't disagree with respect to the certification, but, but it seemed to me it would be the responsibility of the landowner to ask the, his, his tenant or the operator who, who is proposing the comm code, you know, who am I doing business with here? I don't know that it's up to the GMA to tell you. Well, so I, I think it would be prudent to give advance notice of potential liability to the owners. And sure. the only way okay. I know that is who I'm in partners with. Another problem in my particular situation is the allocation. I've mentioned this before, but our water well that we drilled in 2016 has a zero allocation. Well, our variance request has not been heard for three years. We still don't know what our allocation is going to be. I think it's been suggested that my variance application probably has some justification for my 160 acres. We were given a, we were just given two months ago a temporary allocation for the 2022-2023 water year, I don't know if I have a temporary allocation for the 23-24 water year. My tenant, Duda, has to make farming plans for my ranch in February, March of each year to begin October that year. So I'm already six months behind knowing how I can deal with my tenant. And now I don't know what my liability is going to be on a joint and several basis going forward because I haven't received my appropriate allocation from the GMA. So this leads me into another comment about when does this all take effect, com codes or otherwise. I think it's way too early to assume that it should take effect October 1, 2023 when I don't know what my allocation is yet. And my tenant is already making plans to farm my ground in, tw in October 2023. We don't know if we're gonna have hundreds of thousands of dollars of penalties or no penalties, okay? One other just small observation, and I said this last time, I won't get into the, any of the details, but I really think that this is, I'm afraid the whole Com code, the allocation ordinance, is a temporary band-aid. I think, and it's been expressed before, that we should be moving into a land-based allocation system. If my land, if my property had an allocation of two to three acre feet of water per year per acre, wherever that source of the water was coming from, easy to track. You know how much water is going to be used on my property. I either exceed it or I stay blow it. I, I really think the, the, the movement to a land-based system sooner rather than later would really solve a lot of these problems. One last comment, management areas. At least from my standpoint of what I know, I think the con codes probably should be restricted to uh, wells and properties within a particular management code. That's how you're going to manage those difficult areas compared to more robust areas, and I also agree that we have to provide some kind of surface water delivery to those impacted management areas so that they're not treated unfairly. So those are all my comments, unless there's any questions. Thank you, Gary. Thank you. I have a, a follow-up for staff um, with the, uh, I appreciate the comments that were recently brought up regarding the, the responsibility falling on the, on the landowner. And I haven't seen this, this form and, and with the comments from Director Malhart as well as far as the development of, of a form. Does that, when, 
When there is a comm code and there is a signing on of the wells that will be a, a part of it, is there any waiver or any of this language that would uh, place that responsibility and that burden on the landowner who's responsible in terms of communicating that? Or is that part of where we're at right now? I think Sorry, one of the recommendations was to add some language clarifying that and probably to make sure that the ordinance code is clear on that as well. Okay, and, and I think that's, I mean, those reminders, right, that if there, there are uh, changes in ownership um, throughout the year, uh, I, I, going back to the, the initial comment and, and the follow-up from Director Malhart of having that, uh, whether it's a renewal or a recertification or something that uh, is a reminder for, for those participating of what the expectations are uh, from them participating, but also from the operator uh, in terms of communicating and reports and, and where that will be at. Okay. I, I understand our Current ordinance requires a change in ownership be notified to the GMA in 90 days, 30 days. That's our current ordinance. And on your question about the, there's a com code authorization form. This is similar to what you saw in the back of, the, of your packet. Um, I'm sorry, this is an operator operator. The title of this slide is wrong. This is the operator authorization form. There is no com code authorization form, and I think that's what we're talking about to put, provide more clarity there. So apologize for the mistitle on there. Uh, but we do, uh, acting on board direct direction from, I think, past October, the, for a com code, we are now requiring the owners um, signing off that they are aware that their well is going into a com code. No other details are, are in that right now on the other wells in the com code. Any other questions or comments from the public on this item? Please, come forward. Chair, board members, uh, I think for the first time in five years, I had an Apple Watch actually alerted me that my heart rate was exceeding my normal average <laughs> heart rate. So a uh, sense of the stress and, and just complexity of this topic, and it's, it's uh, and it's very, you know, I don't know if it, you know, easy solution to this too. And um, I do appreciate all the work, Arnie. I think we, we spoke last year a little bit, and uh, I'm here on behalf, right, Luis Calderon, on behalf of Ryder, or our bros, as many many know us on the Com Code Well. Um, and I think to to make a couple comments and a little bit of story on our Com Code. We our Com Code became in 2019, so it was very recent. And the reason we did it was because we wanted to manage. A little bit better because it was during the time where there was a lot of, uh, you know, just blur as to how we manage uh, ensuring data was sent correctly, correcting data, and it's it's a lot of work. And you know, we wanted to take a little bit more control to ensure that it was done properly, that we took responsibility. And I think to a lot of the comments uh, that Greg Gary Arnold was saying, it's also on contractually obligated for us to be compliant with regulatory water uh, board, uh, regional water board, and it's, you know, different different areas that come as a result of leasing ground. And so some of this stuff is addressed on a, a contractual basis. And so we, we did that to be able to control it a little bit better, not necessarily to create more work. I think we felt there was actually more work with the mass amount of comcos we had as it created more issues. And, you know, our trend has been focusing on our water usage. Uh, I know in the past, and, and it's come to, to been said by many, well, you guys are hogging water. You guys are, you know, taking control of the water. Well, if you look at our per acre basis, we're probably running a little leaner than a lot of other people. And, you know, I, I do welcome many or any of you guys to come see some of our operations. Our goal is to reduce water consumption in our plants. And we've spent a lot of money investing into substrate farming, you know, mini sprinklers and, you know, any type of deal that we can do to reduce the amount of water we use to grow each pound of fruit we put out of a ranch. So our intent is definitely not to create a water hog, water, you know, high water consuming company. We also know it's a, it's, it's a resource that we have to take care of. Our goal is not to farm for five, 10, 15 years. You know, hopefully, if I, my heart rate doesn't go a little too excess here, you know, I can continue farming and, 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 and working here and, and 
you know, maybe I even one day farm on my own and be able to do it. Uh, but it, unfortunately, it be, it's getting harder and harder. And these are the type of layers that keep layering over and over and over us farmers. And it, it is becoming increasingly harder. So I do, there, there are things that I do agree. I mean, we have to take consideration basin, the health of the basin, what basins the comm code lays at. And I, and I know we did that and we separated by basin just to avoid that. We actually consulted with staff, I think prior to doing our comm code because we wanted to make sure we were doing the right thing. And now sometimes I feel like we did the wrong thing and now we're being, you know, hit in our hand and saying back off, you know, you guys did the wrong thing and now you're gonna be punished. And the reason we're getting punished is because uh, some of our variance requests are being held off because of a comp code issue. So what's gonna happen there? You know, are you guys gonna give us a credit for over pumping, you know, on our variance requests? Uh, are you guys gonna, you know, pass that on and, and, you know, not look that over? So I think there's a lot of uncertainty on bi the business side as well uh, and being able to continue. Additionally, during that time, there was no form for, for landowners to sign on. We actually created our own because we wanted to add an extra layer of ensuring we did the right thing. And we sent it to every single landowner that we added our comm code on and they authorized it. And there were some that they didn't want to and we kept that separate, we respected that. It was not a forced deal. It was more of a conversation and agreement between a tenant and a landowner. And that was a mutual contractual agreement. So we, we agreed to that and some are, okay with it. They want us to take the responsibility and, and a lot of landowners want us to have the responsibility of reporting our water, paying our water. And I mean, I don't know how much communication Ryder has with you guys, but it's quite a bit from Heidi and myself. And, you know, we are, I mean, I don't know if the staff can agree to it, but we are on top of it. We are consistently trying to ensure we're, we're correct on all stuff. So it does feel very continuously that it, it's always against us and, and it's getting harder and harder. And that, I do want to affirm that because it is a, a challenging industry. It, you know, thank God we had some rain. Unfortunately, we had losses too. So, you know, we have to thank for the longer term benefit of water and, and, and that's, we are, we were very appreciative. But also there are macroeconomics that are affecting us a lot more. And I, I you know, to my effect and understanding economics of farming all over the world, we are probably the most expensive area in the world to farm. And that, that is probably 90% sure that that's an effect of it too. Um, so I did want to share that. And, you know, again, we, we understand there's stuff that has to be done, you know, a certain period of day of, of time frame within a year that we can do this, this, this transaction of adding a comm code or, or just, you know, removing a, a well from a comm code as well, you know, I respect that, that's understandable, we have to do that. Um, and you know, the basins, and then a, a formal acknowledgement form. I also think there has to be a good, you know, some type of, of a reinforced acknowledgement form. And that's why we actually created our own. And uh, I think we, we sent it in to Fox Canyon to have it as a backup uh, as well. Um, so, so there are things that we do agree, I think. And, and I, I, again, I think what Greg was saying is true. Is, is it a procedural, uh, issue that we have to figure out, then let's do that. I do feel that, you know, Fox Canyon needs a heavy revamp on technology, on managing and, 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 and accessibility and, and so forth too. And I think, you know, stuff is going faster and faster. We're seeing it within our company where technology is going faster than probably our brains can think about. So there's probably room for us to be more effective here uh, at, and, and support the staff on maybe investment on, on, on management of technology, some type of water technology, technology management. But also I think the consideration of just the effect on business that this is gonna have, you know, the, 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 uh, you know, the direct impact and also understand there's also behind the scenes acknowledgement from landowners, agreements, and there's contractual commitments that already hold us bound to some of these commitments. So thank you guys for the, the time and appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right, um, Arnie. I think um, we've discussed these things. Let me let me just return to the board. I know we've we've given staff a lot of instructions on each and all of the subjects that are um, were listed. Some of them consistent with the recommendations. Some perhaps augmenting them. Um, 
for anything else from from the board or or let me ask staff do you have any specific questions that you wanted direction about that you haven't received so uh, the, 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 uh, the last comment I'll make is I appreciate the comments of the folks in the audience and I, I think I'd like to point out for you this agency is different in a lot of ways than a lot of public agencies that hit the button and you got three minutes. And when I first joined this agency 35 years ago in my first <laughs> time frame with the agency, that was one of the things that I really insisted on is that this is an opportunity. We serve at the pleasure of the public to try to figure out a fair way of doing public business. And it always bothered me when I'd have to go to an agency and I get the, you got four minutes, yet staff and others could blab on for hours on end. And I think that our ability to allow uh, the public to come up and cover the issues they want to talk about and in a dialogue with the board in real time if necessary, I think that's good for the agency. And we heard a lot of things today, both from the board and from the public. This is a complicated issue. We've known it for a long time. I think a couple of takeaways. I think we need to deal with the forms and the documentation better than we're doing. And I'm looking at the form. I have a copy of the form that Gary signed. And I, I don't think it's adequate. I don't think it covers the things we talked about. So I think we need to first of all deal with the documentation, record keeping side of the equation. I think that's a true statement. I also think that we need to have a discussion about how to improve our IT process. We went through the IT process a number of years ago to come up with the current system we have now. And the last time I went on to uh, doing my water report um, for the GMA, um, I went to their training page. And the training page was using documentation that was created years ago. That's not helpful. So I think we need to have a discussion on a budget item. Is it time? To, to upgrade our game from a technical standpoint so we can track this information. If we're going to demand this, which I think we should, we ought to have a way of tracking it. And I think that's part of our responsibility. I think the constituents uh, demand that, and I think we can do that. With regards to the com code and the like, I think you have enough to digest. I'm not going to add to that. You're going to have to bring it back to us and we'll look at it again. But I'm pleased with the way the meeting went because I think it was helpful to have constituents talk to us and allow them to have the time and the space to cover the points they wanted. And I think that's a good job. Thank you. Uh, you, can I? you asked if I had any other specific questions. I don't. You've given me plenty to work on. I think taking the time and working it through the executive committee will, will help us get to a conclusion. But I saw Kim jump up, so I'm going to give him the mic. Well, we just haven't given him enough to do. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you, Artie. Uh, Chair Board, I just wanted to state that we have been, um, you know, we've really identified the uh, form and the notification and the informed consent, which is a theme through here. We can and plan to move forward with updating that uh, that form and the notification so people are much better informed. We don't need an ordinance or resolution to move forward with that. And so, um, you know, with your board's approval, we're going to continue to work on that and update that so we can move forward with that. Yeah, I would support that. Any other questions or comments from the board? That was going to be my comment was that it seems to me there's enough meat on the plate here to at least craft a draft or a resolution or draft ordinance changes and we can start to work through those in the exec committee. Um, I heard a number of things I thought were either understandings of staff's current administrative burden and, and ways that people would be agreeable to fixing it. So I, I think there's enough there to, to get quite a bit laid out. Let, let's, let's get something on the table and, and let people look at it and beat it about a little bit and get down the road. I've given my comments earlier. I've given my comments. 
understand why I must support the all right, this is no action necessary. Just give staff direction. I think we've done that. We have an executive officer's report. I need a motion to receive and file. So moved. And a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. With that, everyone, you know what? We, do, we don't have a closed session on. I'd ask the, the um, executive officer to schedule one, uh, to contact and schedule one in the future, probably before our next meeting, but um, uh, for a a uh, closed session litigation discussion. We don't have one on today. And with that, we're adjourned. Thank you, everyone. Thank you.